Now for a little more terminology. Paul Jorgensen draws some distinctions that some of my students have found very useful. You might find these distinctions confusing at first, but if you do, working through these ideas will clarify your thinking about combination testing quite a bit. The first distinction is exhaustive testing versus equivalence based. You already know this distinction, so I'll use it to introduce some notation. When you do an equivalence class analysis on the primary dimension of a single ordered variable, you typically get the usual four boundaries of interest. The largest and smallest valid values, and values barely below the smallest valid, and barely above the largest valid. I'll call those too low, valid lowest, too big, and valid biggest. In equivalence-based testing, all you test are the boundary cases. In exhaustive testing, you test all the values, not just the boundaries. Usually combination testing is equivalence-based. Jorgensen's next distinction is between normal and robust testing. In Jorgensen's terminology, normal testing means testing only the valid values. Robust testing means testing valid and invalid values. Normally I do robust testing of individual variables, but normal testing when I test variables in combination. Finally, Jorgensen distinguishes between weak and strong testing. His weak testing is what I've called all singles coverage. His strong testing achieves all n-tuple coverage. All pairs coverage is an example of a level of coverage that lies in between weak and strong. Let me illustrate these distinctions with a three variable example. Variables v1, v2, and v3 each have the usual four boundary values. It would take four tests to achieve weak, robust equivalence. You need four tests because you're testing four values of each variable, one value per test. Two of these tests are focused on error handling. They set invalid values for every variable, but the program's probably going to reject these tests on the first invalid value that it hits. It'll ignore the others, and so this test is less informative than it looks. If you want to include error handling cases in combination tests, it's usually better to have only one invalid value per test. If you want to combine invalid values, do that after you've seen what happens when you combine all valid values with just one invalid. Weak normal equivalence strips the tests of the invalid values, achieving all singles coverage of the valid cases. It's common to add interesting tests to a collection of all singles cases. This is especially common in configuration testing. Testing with many devices creates a lot of tests. Systematically combining these, even with all pairs coverage, can create too many tests. And when you sell a product to the public and then support it, people call you up and complain, and you discover that some combinations of devices cause more trouble than others. Some of these combinations involve four or five or six devices together. You're not even going to discover those with all pairs or all triples. So next time you test the product, you explicitly include the troublesome combinations in your configuration tests as special cases. My understanding is that this has often been Microsoft's configuration testing strategy. Start by making sure you achieve all singles, and then add many other combinations that are either widely used in the market or have a challenging support history. Strong normal testing tests every combination of the valid case boundaries. This can be a lot of tests. Strong robust equivalence testing tests all the combinations of all the boundaries, valid and invalid. This is probably unrealistic and unproductive. I mentioned at the start of this lecture that I'd spend most of it on how to use mechanical techniques like all pairs, but then shift to some of the limitations and alternatives to mechanical techniques. It's time for that shift. The combination test design approach I've described so far is mechanical. These are all coverage focused techniques. Just as I pointed out many times in domain testing, that you won't learn much if you only consider the boundaries and not what you're going to do with them. The combinatorial techniques I've described are blind to risks and they are blind to consequences. All they're saying, unless you add more to your test design, is that maybe some unspecified something might go wrong in a way that better be obvious enough for you to notice. If your test includes doing some unspecified something, then includes setting these variables to these values. That's it. If you want any assurance of discovering anything beyond the most obvious, you have to design in testing for the consequences of choosing your variables and their values. You have to figure out what to look for and how you'll notice failures. The combinatorial design process doesn't include any of this. You have to build it in yourself. Back in the 1980s, laser printer manufacturers and video card makers increased the maximum resolution of their output. More dots per inch on the page or on the screen took more memory. 
We tested our product with the new printers and with the new video cards. No problem. We probably tested the product lots of times with a new printer and a new card, but we didn't think about the memory implications, so we missed the obvious test for consequences. When our customers try to print preview with a shipping product, the memory requirements for the new printer collided with the memory requirements for the new card. Blue screen crash. Just because you test a combination, like the printer and the video card, that doesn't mean you get any value from the test at all. You can miss the opportunity for value completely if you don't figure out how to test for consequences. I've tested several work processes and managed the development of a page layout program. We found a remarkable number of bugs over the years across many products that were triggered by trying to cram too big a letter into too small a space in the document. Finding those bugs required risk-sensitive combination testing. Simple mechanical approaches don't take you there. Another challenge that basic combinatorial techniques have trouble with is non-independent variables. To this point, throughout the class, I've assumed that all the variables under test are independent. In effect, what combination testing checks with variables like this is that variables that should be independent are independent. That's nice. But in many cases, the variables aren't supposed to be independent. For example, if a bank's software is supposed to block you from withdrawing money that you don't have, that's a business rule. It involves a combination of several variables. The bank might care about that rule. You might want to check that rule. And you might want to check it under a variety of circumstances. But now you're trying to show that things that are related are handled correctly, and the relationship is spotted every time. That's combination testing, too. Many discussions of domain testing feature tests of several non-independent variables together. This circle gives an example. The domain is defined by the relationship between two variables, x and y. They constrain each other. The constraint rule is x squared plus y squared is less than 100. The set of values that meet that constraint show up on the graph as a filled circle. Now, if these variables were independent, I tested their boundaries. x equals minus 10, x equals 10, y equals minus 10, y equals 10. But because of the dependence between the variables, a combination of boundary values makes absolutely no sense. The pairs of values, like x equals 10, y equals 10, they're all far outside the circle. Nowhere near any place that's interesting. The interesting tests lie right on the circle itself, or just inside it, or just outside it. The mechanical combinations of the boundaries miss the interesting area by a mile. Dates provide another common example of non-independent variables. The date includes the year, the month, and the day of the month. You can't test these as if they were independent, not competently. All pairs type testing doesn't help you reason these combinations out at all. Instead, you have to learn about dates and design tests that are focused on the meaning of the variables and the way they can go wrong. Jorgensen analyzes date fields in significant detail. My last example of all pairs test design, consider tables in OpenOffice Impress. Here's a reminder of the combination chart. The problem is that these variables aren't independent. OpenOffice restricts the numbers of cells in a slide table to 255. So you can't have a table with 75 rows and 75 columns. I chose the other variables for the OpenOffice tests because they looked like they might be interesting to test together. But these all constrain each other. You can't test them all together at all of their boundaries at the same time. You can replace values in the all pairs table with less extreme combinations that are valid. But every replacement involves a judgment call. And it probably turns into several tests replacing one. Let me sum up on this. All pairs testing has been cursed by fashionability. When things come into fashion, people start treating them like miracle insecticides. Nothing fashionable ever lives up to all of its hype. And then people get grumpy and they stop using it completely. Well, all pairs testing is useful. All pairs helps you improve your efficiency. It provides a rationale for sampling a small number of tests from a large pool. That's a good thing. But it's limited. It applies under some circumstances. But even then, it leaves many parts of the design of its tests completely open. You have to combine all pairs with some other kinds of test design techniques, or else you're not going to get anywhere near the value that the fashion mongers will have you think you're going to get.